A hundred years ago, a deceptively simple formula was written. It held the key to how our world began and why it works as it does. The creation of the atom bomb and it uncovered the darkest secrets of the universe. Its author was a youthful Albert Einstein. It's one of the most important and certainly the most famous equation in the world. E equals MC squared. think of equals mc squared, we have this vision of Einstein as an old, wrinkly man with white hair. E equals mc squared is not about an old Einstein. It's actually about a young, energetic, dynamic, even a sexy Einstein. But while we've all heard of young Einstein's equation, very few of us know what it means. In fact, E equals MC squared is so remarkable that even Einstein wasn't sure if it was really true. Albert Erling, you're later than I expected. We've only got sausage and cheese tonight. What is it? We need to talk. Has something happened? Oh, no, nothing. Sorry, no. I spent most of the day staring out the window and looking at trains. <laughs> and I started to think about an object and how much energy it had. Can I explain it to you? Of course you can. But first, mm, dinner, mm, food and talk. I think the gods are laughing at me. <laughs> but the gods were not laughing at Einstein. What he'd done was combine, in one stunning insight, the work of many great visions. This is the story of Einstein and all the scientists who went before, who fought and even died to create each part of the equation. It's a tale of ambition, betrayal, heartache and deceit. And the story of E equals MC squared starts long before the birth of its creator, Einstein, with the discovery of E for energy. In the early 19th century, scientists didn't think in terms of energy. They thought in terms of individual powers or forces. These were all disconnected, unrelated things. The power of the wind, the force of a door closing, the crack of lightning. The idea that there might be some sort of overarching unifying energy which lay behind all these forces had yet to be revealed. One poor hungry man's drive to understand the hidden mysteries of nature would begin to change all that. Young Michael Faraday hated his job. He was uneducated, the son of a blacksmith. He'd been lucky to become a bookbinder's apprentice. But Faraday craved one thing. He craved knowledge. He read every book that passed through his hands. He developed a passion for science. All of his free time and his meager wages were poured into his self-education. He was on the threshold of an incredible journey into the invisible world of energy. Faraday had impressed one of his master's customers and was rewarded with a ticket that would change his life. Can I pass, please? Can I pass? Some of us are trying to improve ourselves. If people will let us. Of course, of course. Pass, pass. 
this way to a better life. <laughs> In the early 1800s, science was a pursuit of gentlemen, something Faraday was clearly not. He had a rudimentary education, he'd read widely, he'd gone to public lectures. But in 1812, he was given tickets to hear Sir Humphrey Davy, the most prominent chemist of the age. <laughs> 19th century scientists were the pop stars of their day. Their lectures were hugely popular. Tickets were hard to come by and Davy reveled in his status. They're waiting. I know. He was also a keen follower of the latest fashion, nitrous oxide, or laughing gas. He said it had all the benefits of alcohol without the hangover. Electricity, ladies and gentlemen. A mysterious force that can unravel the confusing mixture of intermingled substances that surround us and produce pure, pure elements. Davy was an absolutely first-rate scientist. However, many will come to say that his greatest discovery is Michael Faraday. Metals unknown, that is, until I isolated potassium from molten potash and sodium, as I showed you last time, from common salt. That same magical... Faraday may not have been born a gentleman, but he wasn't going to let class barriers stop him from pursuing a career in science. He worked for nights on end to bind his lecture notes into a book for his new hero. Lord, help me think only of others. To be of use to mankind. Help me be part of the great circle that is your work and love. Lord, I am your servant. Well, this is excellent work, Faraday. So what is it you aim to do with your life? My desire, sir, is to escape from trade, which I find vicious and selfish, and to become a science, which I imagine makes its pursuers amiable and liberal. <laughs> Really? Well, I shall leave it to the experience of a few years to set you right on that score. Look, I haven't done anything at the moment. I'll send a note if anything comes up. Despite this humiliating setback, Faraday was determined to break free from his daily toil. His patience was rewarded. Michael Faraday, he's going to be my helper while I recover. He assures me he is a Christian fellow. Perhaps with God and Faraday in charge of the chemicals, you and I will be safe in our place of work. Thank you, Professor Davy. Welcome, Faraday. Oh, no, thank you, and thank you, Sir Humphrey. Just stick to your job and do as you're told, and you'll be fine, Faraday. Faraday became the laboratory assistant, eagerly absorbing every scrap of knowledge that Davy deigned to impart. But in time, the pupil would surpass the master. <laughs> <laughs> 